ان الحمد لله تعالى نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له اشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله ارسله بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا وداعيا الى الله باذنه وسراجا منيرا صلى الله عليه وسلم تسليما كثيرا اما بعد فان استقى الحديث كتاب الله وخير الحدي حدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار Ikhwani, as you know, the title of this reminder today, insha'Allah, is The Grave. Each and every single one of us, every single one of the children of Adam, he goes through three stages. We're all going to go through three stages. The first stage is al hayat al-dunya, the life of this world. This is the first stage. This stage which we are going through now from the moment that we are born, we enter into this dunya until the moment that we die. This is stage number one, the life of this dunya. Then the second stage is the life of the barzakh. The life of the barzakh. And I've purposefully not translated this word barzakh. This is the second stage. And the third stage is the life which occurs when we are resurrected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And a portion enter Jannah and a portion they enter into the fire of Jahannam. So there are three stages that each and every single one of us is going to go through without any exception. Stage number one, the life of this world. Stage number two, the barzakh. And stage number three is when we are resurrected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we take our places in the fire or in the gardens of Jannah. So when we die, when we leave this world, we move into the second stage, the stage of al-barzakh. What does al-barzakh mean? I haven't told you what, what it means. Linguistically, barzakh, it means a barrier. Barzakh means a barrier between two things. So in Surah Al-Furqan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells us that He has created one sea and it is fresh and it is uh, sweet in taste. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created another sea and that one is salty and that one is bitter. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَهُمَا بَرْزَخَ And we have placed between both of those a barzakh. So linguistically in the Arabic language, barzakh means a barrier. So Allah Jalla wa Ala is telling us he's created two seas and between them he's created a barzakh. He's created a barrier. In terms of the Sharia, Barzakh, it refers to that period of life which is from the moment of death to the moment that we are resurrected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So from the moment that we die until the moment that we are resurrected by Allah, everything in between that is Al-Barzakh, it's the Barzakh. So when each and every single one of us dies, we're going to move into the life of the, life of the Barzakh. After that, we're going to be resurrected by Allah. And that's the final stage. The proof for this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells us in the Quran about the one who, when death comes to him, قَالَ رَبِّ ارْجِعُونَ Oh, He says, Oh Allah, send me back. So the moment of death comes to him and he says, Oh Allah, send me back that I may straighten my affairs. I want to sort my life out. I want to do righteousness. And Allah says, No, kalla. It's just a, it's just a word that he is saying. And behind them is a barrier until the day that they are resurrected. 
So when we die, Ikhwan, there is no returning to this life. We enter into the life of the Barzakh and it is a barrier. It's a barrier between what? Us and the life of this dunya. Once you cross over, there's no coming back. You only go on to the final stage. So everything that we're going to be talking about today is the life of the Barzakh. So when you hear about the trials of the grave, the punishment of the grave, the bliss of the grave, what happens when we are placed into our grave. All of this from the moment of death until the moment of resurrection, this is called the Barzakh. Ikhwan, this is a extremely, an extremely important topic that we all need to prepare for. Why? Because as I've said, there's not a single one of us here or there is not a single one of the children of Adam except that we're going to go through this. We're going to go through this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells us, Kullu shay'in halikun illa wajha. Everything will be destroyed except for His face, subhanahu wa ta'ala. All of the life, if we are living, then we're going to die. Even the atheist, the one who doesn't believe in Allah. He believes that there was a big bang, a few things collided and now we have this wonderful creation. Even the atheist cannot deny that he is going to die. Even the atheist must believe in this moment of death. And in Surah Ar-Rahman, Allah Jalla wa Ala, He says, كُلُّ مَنْ عَلَيْهَا فَانْ وَيَبَقَى وَجْهُ رَبِّكَ ذُو الْجَلَالِ وَالْإِكْرَامِ Everything upon it, upon this earth is going to perish. And there is going to remain the face of your Lord, owner of majesty and honor. And in elsewhere, in another part of the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Ali Imran, Kullu nafsin maut. Every single soul is going to taste death. Ikhwan, we're going to leave our families behind. We're going to leave our possessions behind. Our wealth, our property, everything is going to be left behind except for one thing. That is our good deeds. And these deeds are going to accompany us in our grave. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he told us three things, they follow the dead to his grave. Two of which return and one remains with him. His family, his money and his deeds follow him. Then his family and his wealth return and his deeds, they stay with him. This is recorded by Imam Al-Bukhari and Imam Muslim. We're not going to speak about today the moment of death. We're not going to speak about what happens as we pass from the life of the dunya into the life of the barzakh. We're not going to mention that beginning bit. If you want to read upon this, then I advise you to read the hadith which is in Bukhari and Muslim on the authority of Al-Bara ibn Azib. This is a lengthy hadith. We're going to mention parts of it today, but we're not going to mention the beginning part of it. So yeah, Ikhwan, the free slave, the freed slave of Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu an, he narrates that whenever Uthman, this great companion, this great companion, the third Khalifa of the Muslims, whenever he would stand over the grave, he would begin to weep. He would begin to cry. So much so that his beard would become wet. We need to stop here now. The first thing is that it wasn't just one or two tears. Rather, Uthman radiallahu an, when he would stand over the grave, his entire beard would become wet. This is how much he would cry. And he was asked, O oh, Uthman, when you speak about Jannah, or you are reminded about Jannah, the paradise and the hellfire, you don't cry like this. But when you come and you see these graves and you stand over these graves, you cry so much. What's the reason behind it? Uthman radiallahu an, he replied, I heard the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, the grave is the first stage of the hereafter. Whoever passes through it safely, what comes after that will be easier for him. But if he does not pass through it safely, what comes after that will be harder for him. So these graves, Uthman is telling the people, this grave is stage number one of the Akhirah. If we pass the test and this is made easy by Allah, what comes after is going to be easier. 
But if this is hard and this is difficult and we fail in this, then what comes after is only going to get harder and harder and harder until what? Until it ends up in the fire of Jahannam. And then he continued and he said, and I heard the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying, I have never seen anything as disturbing or more terrifying than the grave. He continued and he said, I have never seen anything more terrifying than those scenes in the grave. This is narrated by Imam Al-Tirmidhi and Shaykh Al-Albani rahimahullah. He said this is an authentic hadith. I want to talk about this now. I want to spend just a couple of minutes speaking about this. Look at the attitude of the companions. He said, look at the attitude of the, I was, I was saying, look at the attitude of the companions. When we remember death, when we go to the graveyard, subhanallah, it lasts a minute. And our hearts are so hard. Our hearts are so attached to this dunya that subhanallah, it doesn't have a lasting effect upon us. Yet Uthman radiallahu an, when he would stand over the grave, he would begin to weep and cry. Why? Because he knows that this is the first stage. If this is easy, what comes after is going to be easier. If this is hard, what comes after is going to be much worse. We, in today's uh, reminder, you have two approaches. Either we can just look at the various ahadith pertaining to the torment and the bliss in the grave, or we can have uh, a reminder and we can be more general about it inshallah today I'm going to try and combine the two so I'll first I'll describe these scenes and describe what's going on in the grave and then inshallah we'll look at the various ahadith where I have bought the uh, descriptions from before we do this ya ikhwan I want you to picture yourself in a very dark place so dark that you can't even see your own hand if you put it out in front of you and then somebody comes and says, there is a really venomous snake here with you. And subhanallah, you can't see it, you don't know what it is, you don't know where it is, but you just know that there's a huge amount of fear. This is, I'm not giving you a description of the grave right now, but this is a reference point. That you, the amount of fear that you're going to feel, let's compare it to the picture of the person who is a fasik, an evildoer, he is somebody engaging in, in uh, innovations, he's a mushrik, he's committing shirk, a disbeliever, somebody who has rejected the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or just somebody who has been decreed that he's going to be punished by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this man, he is placed inside of his grave and it's dark. It's extremely dark. It's darkness upon darkness, layers of darkness. It's not that type of darkness which, you know, like uh, you turn, it's dark in your room, you turn it on, it just gets fine. But if you've ever experienced darkness which is thick, it just, the atmosphere feels thick with darkness. It's so dark, subhanAllah, you, you can just feel it. And it's a scary type of darkness. And the man, he is tight and claustrophobic in his grave. He tries to move but he's not getting anywhere. There's no space on the left or on the right. He is tight in this grave. And then the grave squeezes him. When he enters into that grave and he's placed into the grave, the grave, it squeezes him. And this man begins to panic. I want you to imagine this. He's in a dark place. He doesn't know what's going on. He's got no way of escaping. His grave, it squeezes him. It squeezes him. Imagine like a mother, she sees her child after a long time and she grabs him and she squeezes him. The grave squeezes his body like that. And then subhanallah, he sees two angels that are approaching him. Two angels approach him and they are black and blue. Munkar and Nakir. They are coming to him and they have a scary appearance. He's never seen them before. He tries to make a run for it, but he's got nowhere to run. He's got nowhere to hide. All he can see are these two angels and they are approaching him. He doesn't know what's going to happen. He doesn't know what's going to happen. He's unsure. He's never witnessed this. He's never seen anything like this before. He's never experienced anything like this before. And these two angels, they are very rough and tough with him. 
and they order him in a rough way to sit up and they make him sit up in his grave. Imagine how vulnerable he's going to be feeling. Imagine how weak and powerless he's going to be feeling. Imagine that panic. Imagine what his heartbeat's going to be like at that moment. He's got nowhere to run and these two angels are standing in front of him right now. Scary appearances. And then they ask him question number one. Who is your Lord? Question number one. Who is your Lord? But he didn't live a life of Tawheed. He didn't know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this life. He didn't know about the names and attributes of Allah. He didn't live this life knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when those angels ask him the question, he says, ah, ah, I don't know, I don't know. So he's failed the first question. Then they ask him question number two. What is your religion? But he never lived the life of Islam. He never lived the life of submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He turned away from Allah. He turned away from Islam. He didn't live the answer to the question in this life. So in the grave, he's not able to answer that question. He says, ah, ah, I don't know, I don't know. So he's failed the second question. Imagine what's going to be going through him at this moment. He doesn't know what's going on. All he knows is he's got these two angels in front of him and he's failed two questions. Two out of two, he's got them both wrong. The third question that they ask him now, who was this man that was sent to you? But he didn't know the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He didn't follow his sunnah. He didn't obey him in his, obli on, in his commands. He didn't stay away from his prohibitions. He didn't know the sunnah of the Messenger alayhi salam. Perhaps he innovated into the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he says, ah, ah, I don't know, I don't know. And in another narration, he says, I heard the people saying something. So I just followed them. My father used to say he is the Messenger of Allah. My friends used to say he is the messenger of Allah. So what did I do? I just followed them. I just, I just said what the people said. Or I wanted to get in with the Muslims. I could spy on the Muslims and report back to the people. So I just said what the people said. He says, ah, I don't know, I don't know. Then a voice calls out, or rather the angels, they reply to him and they say, May you never know and may you never say what the people said. And then a voice, it cries out, a voice calls out and it says, My slave is lying. Supply him, furnish his grave with the furnishings from the hellfire. Open a door to the hellfire for him. And then the heat and the fire from Jahannam and the furnishings of Jahannam, they are brought into his grave. And then Ya Ikhwan, the grave, it squeezes him and it compresses him until his ribs, they interlock. They, the ribs which are on both sides of his body, his rib cage, it joins in. It interlocks upon itself. Imagine this, Ya Ikhwan, when somebody squeezes you, somebody big and strong, he gives you a hug, he gives you a squeeze, you feel it. But imagine the grave which is going to squeeze this man until his ribs, they interlock with one another. Imagine that pain, Ya Ikhwan. Imagine that suffering. He's got nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. And then a man appears in his grave. A man walks towards him in his grave and he has a foul stench, ugly clothes, an ugly, scary appearance. And then this man says to the person who is being punished, he says, receive the, glad, receive the tidings of that which is going to distress you. This is the day which you were promised. And then the deceased, that dead man, he says, may Allah curse you, who are you? Who are you? He's saying to this man, who are you? May Allah curse you. Your face, it brings evil. Your face looks like you're coming with some evil news. And then the man says, he says, I am your evil deeds. 
He says to the dead man, I am your evil deeds. By Allah, all I knew of you was that you were slow to obey Allah and you were quick to disobey Allah. And then he says, Jazakallahu sharran. May Allah recompense you with evil. Then another creation is bought. And the Prophet wasallam told us, then Allah appoints over him, appoints over this dead man, one who is blind, he is deaf and he is dumb, in whose hand is an iron rod. An iron rod, which if he was to strike a mountain, the mountain would turn to dust. And then the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he continued, he told us that he strikes this deceased man until he turns to dust. So this creation, whatever he is, and Allah knows best, we affirm that this is the truth. He comes with an iron rod and he strikes the dead man until he turns to dust, ya ikhwan. He turns to dust. And then his body is restored by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he is struck again. And he utters a scream. He utters a screech which is heard by everything except for man and jinn. Everything hears that scream except for man and jinn. And then this door to the hellfire is opened for him and his grave is furnished as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, as the Prophet sallallahu he told us. And the man says, oh Allah, don't let the hour come. Oh Allah, don't let the hour come. He's begging Allah, don't establish yawm al-qiyamah because I've seen my place in the fire of Jahannam. I know that when you resurrect me, I'm going to enter into that fire. So he says, oh Allah, don't let this day come. Don't bring on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Ya Ikhwan, imagine this now. Imagine he's placed in his grave, he's squeezed. He gets the three questions wrong. Then his, his ribs interlock and then he's hit. Imagine if this happened just once. Imagine if this has happened just once. Wouldn't it be enough of a punishment for this individual that he sees his place in the fire? Wouldn't it be enough of a punishment for this man to know that when Yawm Al-Qiyamah is established, I'm going to go into that place over there? Wouldn't it be enough of a punishment for him? Yet subhanAllah, this punishment where he is hit over and over and over and his ribs interlock, it's going to continue happening until Yawm Al-Qiyamah. It's going to continue happening to this man until the day that he is resurrected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah protect us from this. This is the punishment of the grave. This is the trials of the grave. For that person whom Allah Jalla wa Ala, he has decreed that he's going to go through this. Let's look at the other side now. Let's look at the rewards or the situation of the Muwahid, the person of Tawheed, the person who followed Sunnah, he stayed away from innovations, the person who he repented to Allah, and the one whom Allah, the fortunate one, the blessed one, whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed that he is going to be protected from this punishment. This man, he is going to be placed in his grave. And ya ikhwan, the darkness of this grave is the same. Just as I described the darkness for the one who is going to be punished, the darkness of this grave is going to be the same at this point. He's placed in his grave and it's dark. And the grave squeezes him the same way it will squeeze every single one of us without fail. We're all going to be squeezed by that grave, ya ikhwan. The grave squeezes him and it's tight and it's claustrophobic and he too is feeling this sensation of I don't know what's going to happen to me. I don't know what's going to happen to me next. And Munkar and Nakir, those same two angels, they come in the same way, in the same scary form, black and blue. And they tell him in the same rough and tough way, sit up. They tell him in the same rough way, sit up in your grave. And the man, he sits up. He sits up, but this is where it's different now. This is where this one, he is saved and his experience is slightly different or extremely different. So the first one, the first question that they ask you, Who is your Lord? Who is your Lord? 
the man, he lived upon Tawheed. He knew about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He worshipped Allah jalla wa ala. He knows who Allah is in this life and he lives the answer to that first question. So he says, Rabbi Allah. My Lord is Allah. And then they ask him the second question. What is your religion? What is your religion? The man in this life, he strives for Islam. He strives to implement Islam. He says, Deeni Islam. My deen is Islam. And then they ask him that third question. And he says, Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. My prophet is none other than Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And in another narration, he says he is the messenger of Allah. And then he takes the shahada and he says, I bear witness that none has the right to be worshipped except for Allah. And that Muhammad is his slave and his uh, messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then a voice cries out from heaven and it says, my slave has spoken the truth. My slave has spoken the truth. Supply him with furnishings from Jannah and clothe him from the clothes of Jannah and open for him a gate to Jannah. And then, Ya Ikhwan, his grave is widened for him for as far as the eye can see. And it's lit up for him and he can see his place in Jannah. And the fine scent and the fine smell of Jannah percolates through his grave. And then he sees a man walking towards him with a bright face, beautiful face, a handsome man with nice clothes. And he says, he says to this man, receive the news of that which will delight you. Receive glad tidings of that which will delight you. This is the day which you were promised. And then the man says, the deceased, he says, may Allah bless you. What did the kafir, what did the one who's going to be punished? He says, may Allah curse you. Your face brings evil. But this one he says, may Allah bless you. Your face looks like you are coming with good news. Who are you? Who are you? And then the, the, the man, the handsome man, he says, I am your good deeds. I am your good deeds. By Allah, all I ever knew of you was that you were quick to obey Allah and you were slow to disobey him. Jazakallahu khairan. May Allah reward you, recompense you with goodness. Subhanallah. This is when the Prophet ﷺ told us that the man he is going to be followed to his grave by three things. Two are going to return, one is going to stay with him. His wealth and his family return, but his good deeds they remain with him. So this righteous companion, his good deeds are going to stay with him until Yawm Al-Qiyamah. And when this man he sees his place in Jannah, he says, Oh Allah, hasten on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Hurry up and establish the day of judgment. Why? Because I want to enter. I want to go back to my family. I want to go back to my wealth. And then he is told, chill out, be calm, be calm and be at ease. Subhanallah. Look at this difference, Ya Ikhwan. Look at the difference between the one who is going to be punished. He is going to be punished until Yawm Al-Qiyamah. And the one who he is going to be rewarded and in a state of bliss until Yawm Al-Qiyamah. I want to mention now the various ahadith that I have used to uh, bring together these descriptions. Because it's important, as we know, when something is an aspect of the unseen, be that Jannah, be that the Hellfire, be that the grave, be that Yawm Al-Qiyamah, be that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, the angels, the jinn, whatever it is, any aspect of the unseen, we must stick to the narrations. We can't use our own intellect. So we stick to the narrations, that which has been mentioned. So as for the darkness of the grave, I mentioned that when both, the one who is punished and the one who is rewarded. When they are placed, we are all going to experience the darkness of the grave. The narration behind this is that there used to be an, uh, an, uh, an old lady who used to clean the masjid, uh, Masjid al-Nabawi. And she died. She died during the night 
and the companions, they buried her. They didn't want to wake the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was asleep, Alayhi Salatu Salam. They didn't want to wake him, so they buried her. The Prophet Alayhi Salam, he realized that this woman is missing. So then he asked the companions, where is she? Where is she? They told him what had happened. And so he went to, those, uh, to her grave and then he made dua. He prayed over her. He asked Allah to forgive her. And then the Prophet ﷺ, he said, these graves are full of darkness. But Allah illuminates them for their occupants by virtue of my praying for them. This is narrated by Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Dawood and others. We mentioned about the squeezing of the grave. And I said that every single one of us is going to be squeezed by our grave. There's not going to be a single one of us who is not squeezed by his grave. The Prophet ﷺ told us about Sa'd ibn Mu'adh radiallahu an, that he was squeezed by his grave. The Prophet ﷺ told us when he was burying him, this is the one, referring to Sa'd, this is the one at whose death the throne of Allah shook, for whom the gates of Jannah were opened, and whose funeral was attended by 70,000 angels. He has been squeezed once, then it released him. So even Sa'd, radiallahu an, he was squeezed once and then the grave released him. Shaykh al-Albani, he said this is an authentic hadith. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he also said, there is squeezing in the grave. If anyone were to have been saved from it, it would have been Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh. So if even Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh radiallahu an was squeezed, then we are all going to be squeezed. Even the children are going to be squeezed in the grave. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, if anyone were to have been saved from the squeezing of the grave, it would have been this child. So this squeezing of the grave, Ikhwan, we are all going to go through it. With regards to the trials of the grave, um, I'll mention a few of the ahadith. In fact, there's so many, but I'll mention a few of them to save some time. The Prophet wasallam he said, when the deceased, or in another narration, or when one of you is buried, two black and blue angels come to him, one who is called Al-Munkar, and the other one is called Al-Nakir, and they say, what did you say about this man? And he tells them what he used to say, he is the slave of Allah and his messenger. But if he was a hypocrite, he says, I heard the people saying something, and I just said likewise, I don't know, I don't know. This is in Sunnah Tirmidhi, and Shaykh Al-Albani said, this is authentic. According to another narration, the narration of Al-Bara ibn Azib, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, two very harsh angels come to him and treat him roughly and make him sit up. They say to him, who is your Lord? What is your religion? Who is your Prophet? This is the last trial to which the believer is subjected. And then this is what Allah refers to in the ayah. I'm going to recite this ayah now, but before we do it, the point here, Ya Ikhwan, there are some people today and they say, just learn the answers to those three questions now and then you'll be able to answer them in the grave. Learn them today. Don't live. You don't need to live the answers. Learn the answers today and then you are going to be able to uh, answer those questions. Some of the Sufi, some of the Sufis, they say, don't worry, I am your Sheikh, I am your Peer. I will answer the questions in your grave for you. Whereas Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, يُثَبِّتُ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا بِالْقَوْلِ الثَّابِتِ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ وَيُضِلُّ اللَّهُ الظَّالِمِينَ وَيَفْعَلُ اللَّهُ مَا يَشَاءُ Allah keeps firm those who believe with the firm word in the worldly life and in the hereafter. When Allah says, وَفِي akhira in the hereafter, this is the final trial that the believer will go through, subhanAllah. When he is in this much distress, if it was left down to us, we wouldn't be able to answer, Ya Ikhwan. Because of the stress, because of the, uh, because of the panic of that which we see, we wouldn't be able to answer those questions. يُثَبِّتُ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا It is Allah who keeps those who believe firm. So it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who keeps the believers firm. 
And then the Prophet ﷺ, this is the uh, tafsir of this ayah which the Prophet ﷺ has told us about in Bukhari and Muslim. And then the man after, because of this thabat which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given him, keeping him firm, keeping him steadfast, keeping him upright, he says, my Lord is Allah, my religion is Islam, and my Prophet is Muhammad ﷺ. Ikhwan, some of the people, they say that there's no punishment of the grave. We've opened the grave and we can't see any punishment. We can't see the window to Jannah. We can't see the man with the iron rod hitting him over the head. We can't see the good companion or the, or the evil, his evil deeds. We can't see any of this. Because we can't see it, we don't believe it. This is an issue. This is a problem. They've placed their own intellect over the texts of the Quran and the Sunnah. It's very important, ya ikhwan. We understand this life of the barzakh, it is a part of the akhirah. We accept the texts. And whether the person, he dies in a plane crash, whether he is buried in the ground, whether he dies in a missile and he blows up into a million pieces, he's going to go through the life of the barzakh. He is going to be tested by Allah. He is going to be either rewarded or punished by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As for how we leave the house with Allah jalla wa ala. Like Imam Malik, he told, he told us, he said, when the man said, how is it that Allah is how is it that Allah descends in the last third of the night? How does Allah descend in the last third of the night? Imam Malik, he told us. He said, as for the descending is well known. As for the hows, they are unknown. Believing in it is obligatory. Asking about it is an, is an innovation. So a person says, how is it that man, he died in a plane crash and his body was blown up into a thousand pieces. How is he going to be uh, you know, trialed in the grave like this? We say, as for the hows, we leave them with Allah. We believe in the texts of the Quran and the Sunnah. Ikhwan, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he was able to hear the, 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 the cries of the one who was being punished in his grave. It's narrated by Imam Muslim that whilst the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam was in the garden of Banu Najjar on his mule and the companions were with him, his mule took a different route and nearly threw him off. So the Prophet ﷺ is on, riding on his mule, suddenly his mule changes direction and the Prophet ﷺ nearly actually falls off the mule. There were graves there. The companion, Zayd ibn Thabit, he narrates that there were graves there. Six or five or four. Then the Prophet ﷺ asked his companions, who knows whose graves these are? A man said, I do. The Prophet ﷺ asked him, he said, when did these people die? And then, the man said they died at the time of shirk. A side note, if the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had ilm al-ghayb, would he have asked this question? No. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam didn't have knowledge of the unseen. That's why he asked who is buried in these graves? When did they die? The companion tells him they died at the time of shirk. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said this ummah will be tested in their graves. Were it not that you might become afraid to bury one another, I would pray to Allah to make to uh, allow you to be able to hear the torment of the grave. The Messenger is telling us that I would make dua to Allah to allow you people to be able to hear what was going on in the grave of torment, of punishment. But I am scared that if that happened, you wouldn't even bury one another. You'd stop burying one another to try and get away from that. Shaykh Islam Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, he mentions about they used to have animals and the animals they would get a type of indigestion where they weren't able to go to the toilet properly. Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, he mentions we would take them, take the animals to the graveyards of the kuffar, of the non-Muslims and when they would enter they would hear the screams of those people being punished and they would automatically be released from their indigestion. Whatever was stuck, they would automatically come out. Such was the fear. Remember the Prophet ﷺ says that when they're punished, he emits a scream that everything can hear except for mankind and the jinn. Ikhwan, are the Muslims going to be punished in their graves? And if they are, for how long? This question was asked to Shaykh 
Ibn Uthaymeen rahimahullah and he said if a person is a kafir then there is no way that the delight will ever reach him and his torment will, con will be continuous continuous until Yawm Qiyamah if a person was a sinner but he was a believer then his torment in the grave will be proportionate to his sin do we all understand this? that the grave, the punishment of the grave will be proportionate to his sin and perhaps the punishment for his sin will take less time than the time of the, of the barzakh and it will cease. So perhaps when he is first placed, he gets the torment of the grave. And by virtue of that, his sins are wiped away and then the punishment will cease by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let's look at some specific reasons now for being punished in the grave. Specific reasons for facing the adab of the qabr. Number one and number two, not taking precautions to prevent yourself from being soiled with urine. So when you go and you relieve yourself, not taking precautions that the urine doesn't touch you. And number two, spreading slander, i.e. spreading namima. That is spreading rumors about one another to try and get, you know, to arouse trouble between the people. How many people are upon this? Maybe not the urine, but how about the spreading of the slander? Making up lies, telling this one, telling this thing to that person, going behind his back and saying something else to the other person to cause trouble and evil between the brothers. Bukhari and Muslim, they narrate from Ibn Abbas that the Prophet ﷺ passed by two graves and said they are being punished but they are not being punished because of any major sin. Then he said, yes, one of them used to go around spreading slander and the other used not to take precautions to prevent himself from being soiled with urine. So again, cleanliness in terms of your physical thing, but also cleanliness with your tongue. Don't go around spreading slander, spreading namima. In another narration, the Prophet ﷺ, he said, most of the punishment of the grave is because of urine, so protect yourselves from it. The third thing, ghulul, stealing the war booty. Stealing the war booty, taking from the war booty before it is distributed. Abu Hurairah radiallahu an, he narrates that a man uh, gave a gift to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He gave him a slave as a gift called Mid'am. And whilst this man was bringing something to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, bringing him his saddle. This man was bringing the saddle to the messenger of Allah alayhi salatu salam. An arrow came out of nowhere and hit him and killed him. So he was coming to give something to the Messenger of Allah. He is the slave now of the Prophet ﷺ. An arrow comes out of nowhere, hits him and kills him. The people, they began to say, how fortunate he is, paradise is his. Paradise is his. But the Prophet ﷺ said, no. By the one in whose hand is my soul, the cloak which he took from the war booty on the day of Khaybar, before the booty had been shed out, will burn him with fire. And subhanAllah, look at the taqwa, look at the fear of Allah, of these companions. When the people heard that, another man, he came and he bought out one or two shoelaces one or two shoelaces which didn't belong to him and he said a shoelace of fire or two shoelaces from fire they understood ya ikhwan if you take something like this it's going to be fire it's going to be wrapped around you and it's going to be the fire of jahannam in your grave so the prophet ﷺ says no that which he took from the booty of Khaybar is going to be wrapped around him fire in his grave Another man comes upon hearing this and he brings a shoelace or two shoelaces and he says, these are shoelaces of fire. I.e. I took them without your permission, without your knowledge and now I'm returning them to you because I fear the punishment of the grave. Number four to number seven, lying, neglecting the Quran, zina and riba, indulging in interest. This is a lengthy hadith, but I'm going to read it to you because it's, subhanAllah, it's a beautiful hadith. It's narrated by, it's recorded by Imam al-Bukhari. That when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had prayed, he would turn to face us. And he asked, who amongst you has seen a dream this night? 
And if anybody had seen a dream, they would describe it and they would say whatever Allah had willed and then the uh, Prophet ﷺ, he would give them its interpretation. So one day he asked us, has any of you seen a dream? And they all said no. So then the Prophet ﷺ said, but last night I saw a dream that two men, they came to me. They took me by the hand and accompanied me to the Holy Land. There was a man sitting and another man standing with an iron hook in his hand which he inserted into the corner of his mouth and he tore it to the back of his head. Imagine this iron hook is being inserted into his mouth and it's been pulled and it's ripped to the back of his head. Then he did the same on the other side. So imagine this ya ikhwan. A man is standing there in front of another man. He places a hook in his mouth. He rips it, drags it, rips from his, from his mouth here all the way to the back of his head. And then he takes it out and then he places it in this side. And he rips the other way all the way to the back of his head. Then his face was restored and the same thing happened again. So upon seeing this, the Prophet ﷺ asked, what is this? What's going on here? The two people, the two companions who took the Prophet ﷺ, they said, keep going. And then the Prophet ﷺ, he continues, so we kept going until we came to a man who was lying on his back with another man standing at his head, holding a rock or a stone with which he smashed his head. He smashed his head. So there's a man lying down flat. There's another man standing over him with a big rock and he throws it and he smashes his head into pieces. After the rock struck him, the, the rock rolled away and he chases after it. So the man, he goes and he says, okay, I need to get my rock. So he goes back and he gets the rock. By the time he comes back, the man's head has been, uh, been restored and he keeps striking it. So he strikes his head with the rock and it rolls away. He goes to get it. By the time he comes back, the man's head has been restored by Allah. And then the man smashes it again and it keeps going on. Upon seeing this, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, What is this? What's going on? What is this? The companions who took him, they said, keep going. So we kept going until we came to a hole like a tanur, which is a type of oven, which was narrow at the top and wide at the bottom, under which a fire was lit. Under which a fire was lit. When it came near, the, they rose up and they almost came out of it. It's referring to people. And when it died down, they went back down into it. In it were naked men and women. Imagine a massive tanur. Uh, like a, a, subhanallah, like a type of oven. Narrow at the top, wide at the bottom. In it are naked men and women. And there is a fire underneath it. And when that fire burns up, they rise and they almost get out to the top. And then they come back down. And they just keep going through this. And in it were naked men and women. I queried, what is this? They said, keep going. So we kept going until we came to a river of blood in which a man was standing. On the riverbank was another man before whom were some stones whom the man was in the river started walking. So there's a, blood of, a river of blood. There's a man in it and there's another man on the bank. The man in the river, he's walking towards the man on the river bank. So... Uh, we kept going until we came to river blood. When he wanted to come out, he threw a stone into his mouth and he went in back to where he was. And every time he wanted to come out, he threw a stone into his mouth and he went back to where he was. I question, what is this? They said, keep going. And then we came to a green garden, etc., etc., until the rest of the hadith. So then the Prophet wasallam, after seeing all of this, he said, Tonight you have taken me around. Tell me about the things that I have seen. They said, Yes, we will do that. The one whom you saw with his cheeks being torn from open was a liar who used to tell lies which would spread far and wide. A liar who would tell lies, they would spread far and wide. Make up rumors about people, slander, lies, and then he would just spread them and they would spread far and wide. What you, saw, what you saw being done to him will be done until Yawm Al-Qiyamah, until the day of resurrection. The one who you saw with his head being smashed was a man whom Allah taught the Qur'an, but he slept 
and ignored it at night and he did not act upon it by day. That will be done to him until Yawm Al-Qiyamah. The ones whom you saw in the hole, in the tanur, they are the adulterers, those who commit zina. And the one whom you saw in the river, in the river was the one who consumed riba. Ya Ikhwan, all of these punishments, the one being ripped from back to front, the one having his head smashed in, the ones in the tanur, the one who's in the fire, uh, the, the one who's in the river of blood, all of this is happening in the barzakh. All of this and the proof, this will be done until the day of resurrection. This will be done to them until Yom Al-Qiyamah. They're going to be punished like this in their graves. How? Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. In general, we're running out of time, but in general, another reason for punishment is turning away from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not sticking to the deen of Allah jalla wa ala. I want to mention to you another, another hadith because it's an amazing hadith which it proves that we physically we can see the effects of the one who is being punished. There was a Christian man and he used to and he became Muslim and he used to recite Surah Al-Baqarah and Surah Ali Imran and he used to write the revelation down for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Later on this man he apostated. He went back to Christianity and then he began to say this Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he doesn't know anything. He doesn't know anything except for that which I've written for him. This was a man ya ikhwan who he used to write down the revelation for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He left Islam. He started saying that this Muhammad alayhi salam, he doesn't know anything except for what I write for him. Then Allah caused him to die and the people buried him. They buried him but in the, in the morning they saw that the earth had thrown out his body. Imagine this, they bury him, they close the grave, they go away. They come back the following morning, his body is laying on the top of the earth. The grave has thrown him out. It's rejected him. The earth has rejected him. They said, this is the act of Muhammad and his companions. They dug the grave of our companion and took his body out of it because he had run away from them. So they dug a deeper grave. And in the morning, they found that his body had been rejected by the grave. They found that his body was lying out on the earth. They said again, this is the act of Muhammad and his companions. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They dug the grave of our companion because he left him, left them. Then on the third day, they dug the grave as deep as they could go. As deep as they could physically go, they dug him a grave. They put him in and then in the morning they came back and they saw that the earth had rejected his body once again. So they believed that what had befallen them was not done by human beings and they actually left him out on the ground. They just left him there. This was from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Very briefly, ya ikhwan, things which will save you from the punishment of the grave by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The first thing, seeking refuge in Allah from the punishment of the grave. According to the hadith of Aisha, our mother Aisha radiallahu anha, a Jewish woman came to her and she said, may Allah protect you from the torment of the grave. She asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he said, yes, the torment of the grave. And then our mother Aisha radiallahu anha, she narrates, I never, after that, I never saw the messenger of Allah pray any prayer, but that he would seek refuge with Allah from the torment of the grave. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to his companions, seek refuge with Allah from the torment of the grave. And then the companions would say, na'udhu billahi min adhab al-qabr. We seek refuge with Allah from the torment of the grave. Then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, seek Allah's protection from the torment of the grave, for the torment of the grave is real. And in another hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which Shaykh al-Albani said is authentic, he said, seek refuge with Allah from the torment of the grave. Seek refuge with Allah from the hellfire. Seek refuge with Allah from the trial of the false messiah. Seek refuge with Allah from the trials of living and dying. 
on this point, it's narrated by Ibn Abbas radiallahu an that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us this dua the same way he would teach us a surah from the Quran. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min adhab jahannam wa'udhu bika min adhab al-qabr wa'udhu bika min fitna al-masih al-dajjal wa'udhu bika min fitna al-mahya al-fitna al-mahya wal-mamat fitna al-mahya wal-mamat Oh Allah, I seek refuge with you from the torment of the hellfire. I seek refuge with you from the adab, the torment of the grave. I seek refuge with you from the trials of the Masih al-Dajjal, the false Messiah. And I seek refuge with you from the trials of living and dying. The Shaheed. The Shaheed, he is uh, protected from the torment of the grave. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said the Shaheed will have six blessings with Allah. He will be forgiven from the first drop of his blood that is shed. He will be shown his place in paradise. He will be spared from the torment of the grave. He will be protected from the terror of Yawm Al-Qiyamah. A crown of dignity will be married, uh, will be placed on his head. One ruby of which is better than the earth and everything that is in it. He will be married to 72 from the, of, the, of the Huris and he will be permitted to intercede for 70 of his relatives. Somebody asked him, why? <laughs> What's so special about the, uh, about the shaheed that he is saved from the trial or the punishment of the grave? And the Prophet ﷺ said, the flashing of the sword above his head is sufficient as a trial for him. The flashing of the sword above his head or the whizzing of the bullets past his ears is sufficient as a trial for him. Because of that trial which he goes for the sake of Allah in the correct jihad, he will be protected from the trial of the grave or the punishment of the grave. Another thing that we can do is recite Surat Al-Mulk every single night. The 67th surah, Tabarak al biyadihi al-mulk, is narrated from Abu Huraira that the Prophet wasallam said, a surah from the Quran containing 30 verses will intercede for a man so that he will be forgiven. It is uh, surah Tabarak al biyadihi al-mulk. In another narration, Abdullah ibn Masood radiallahu anhu, he said, whoever recites or reads Tabarak al biyadihi al-mulk every night, Allah will protect him from the torment of the grave. The one who dies of a stomach disease, a stomach illness. A man died from a stomach illness and then the companions were speaking amongst one another and one of them said to the other, didn't the Prophet wasallam say, whoever dies of a stomach disease will not be tormented in his grave? And the other one said, yes, he did. According to another report, you have spoken the truth. Shaykh al-Albani rahimahullah said this is an authentic hadith. The one who dies on a Friday, according to the hadith of Abdullah ibn Amr, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, there is no Muslim who dies on Friday, but Allah will save him from the trials of the grave. This is narrated by Imam Ahmad Tirmidhi and it is an authentic hadith. Ikhwan, in reality, we've run out of time, but we can see that this stage of the barzakh, subhanallah, it's worth taking some of our precious time and studying it, learning about it. It's a stage which we are all going to go through. After the life of this dunya is the life of the barzakh. After the life of the barzakh is either uh, the fire of Jahannam or paradise on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. And I just want to end with this hadith or the saying of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam which we mentioned earlier, uh, which Uthman radiallahu an, he told us, the grave is the first stage of the hereafter. Whoever passes through it safely, whatever comes after that will be easier for him. But if he does not pass through it safely, whatever comes after that will be harder for him. So I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from the adab of the qabr. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from the trials of the grave. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us thabat and keep us firm and allow us to answer those three questions when we are asked by those angels. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make our grave a garden from the gardens of Jannah um, and to make it as wide as the eye can see and then on Yawm Al-Qiyamah to enter us into Jannatul Firdaus Al-A'la. Ultimately Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk.